Good evening. My name is Jeff Brooke Thorson. I'm the Associate Director of TIZED, the Trachi Institute for Sustainability in Engineering and Design. Along with Professor Subhashis Koshal, who's the Director of TIZED, I would like to welcome everyone watching to our fourth annual SED Talks event. We typically hold this event in the spring. We're scheduled to do so in March. But since this year is anything but typical, we have shifted our program to the virtual format. And though we look forward to the day when we can again gather together in person, we hope that this format will make the event accessible to more people. For those who don't know much about the SED Talks program, it was created in order to highlight the excellent research being done by graduate students in the McGill Faculty of Engineering on topics that are important to transitioning our society towards a more sustainable future. This event also gives us the chance to engage with the Greater Montreal and McGill communities and bring them into the conversation while we showcase some of the solutions that we're working on in order to meet the sustainability challenges that we face as a society. The SED Talks program starts off in the fall with a call to graduate students across our faculty who are performing research in any relevant area of sustainability. These students then participate in a series of workshops focused on building communication skills, and these sessions are offered in collaboration with McGill's Skill Sets program. All of the workshop participants receive training sessions on how to talk it up without dumbing it down, how to improve their graphics and visuals in their presentations, and how to improve their presentations and stage presence, as well as a practice session to prepare and get feedback for the three-minute thesis competition. Following the training sessions, we hold a three-minute thesis competition where all workshop participants are asked to present their research in three minutes with one static slide to support their talk. Three students are then selected by a committee that comprises representatives from our faculty, from industry, and several graduate students, typically previous change makers, to continue in the winter training. And we have termed these three students as our change makers because we believe that students must have both excellent fundamental research backgrounds, but also effective communication skills in order to be future ready and to implement the sustainability solutions that are needed for our society. Then in the winter semester, these three change makers receive personalized training and coaching on how to communicate their research effectively and prepare their engaging presentations. I hope that you'll agree with me that their efforts have paid off. At this point, I'd like to welcome the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, Jim Nicell, to say a few words of welcome. Thank you, Jeff. On behalf of the Faculty of Engineering, welcome to the fourth annual SED Talks event. This event is a forum for highlighting innovative sustainability research that is taking place in our faculty. We know that a transition to a society uh, of our society towards sustainability is essential to long-term prosperity, quality of life, and the future of our planet. And we recognize the important role that universities must play in this. Universities are places where the next generation of professionals are trained and must make sustainability a key part of their work. Moreover, universities are the place where we have the diversity of people and disciplines that give us an incredible capacity to take on global challenges. I hope I don't have to work hard to convince you that McGill is committed to sustainability. As McGill enters its third century, we have made concrete commitments in our operations, our research and our teaching that will transform ourselves from a, to a very sustainable institution. Similarly, the Faculty of Engineering has made sustainability a key pillar in its educational and research programs. We've integrated the concepts of sustainability in all our programs, undergraduate and graduate. Moreover, we've established the Trotsky Institute for Sustainability and Engineering Design with a key mandate to not only educate but promote research in sustainability in engineering design across engineering fields, uh, architecture and urban planning. And moreover, we have played a very important role in a cross-cutting interdisciplinary initiative called the McGill Sustainability Systems Initiative. And more broadly, we are directly implicated as a huge partner in the new VIC project, which is, is dedicated toward transforming the Royal Victoria Hospital site into a facility second to none that will be dedicated to sustainability and public policy. Now, when it comes to education and research and sustainability, a key part of what we must do is not only in conducting the research and educating people about sustainability, but to communicate and engage with our community. As such, the SED Talks program aims to highlight the excellent research being done in our faculty, but while also providing our graduate students with the knowledge and the capability where they can develop public speaking skills and provide outreach to the larger community. These skills really support essentially an entrepreneurial mindset that means our graduates will be equipped to not only compete, but thrive in today's global marketplace, all while helping communities transition to a greener, more equitable future. This evening, we have an opportunity to hear from several of our graduate students. A diverse group will cover diverse topics, from how we design a better solar cell, 
to remove exotic pollutants from our water or how to make a commercial flights more sustainable. Now, all of this is not just a credit to our students and staff working in TISED and through across our faculty, but a credit to all of you who become involved in our activities. An essential part of our, our work is not only inform, but to be informed by perspectives from our community members. As such, your involvement in today's conversations are absolutely critical, and we want to thank you for being involved. With that, I just say thank you for being here, and I hope you enjoy the evening's program. Thank you very much, Jim. A few words about the format of tonight's event. We have three speakers and each will present for about 15 to 20 minutes. In order to not disrupt the flow of the evening, we will have a live Q&A session with all of the change makers after the last speaker presents. In the meantime, we invite you to submit your questions throughout the talks via Twitter using the hashtag SedTalks2020 or by email to tized.gill.ca. If you could please specify who your question is for when you submit it, that will help us direct it to the appropriate speaker. And now, without further ado, let me introduce our first change maker of the evening, Elena Corella Puertas, a fourth year PhD student in the Department of Chemical Engineering, studying in the Plasma Processing Laboratory under the co-supervision of Professors Sylvain Coulomb and Viviane Yorjo. Tonight, Elena will tell us about how to use the power of lightning to ensure the safety of our water supplies. Elena, please. When you look at this picture, what do you see? A mother and her daughter, a family of ducks, plants by the shore of a river. Well, what I see when I look at this picture is water, because water is essential to all of them, to humans, to animals, and to plants. In fact, most of the Earth's surface is covered with water, over 70%. However, less than 3% of this water is available to us as fresh water, as most of the water is either found salty in oceans or trapped as ice in the poles. Now, I would like you to think of your favorite river or lake. How does it look like? Does it have beautiful vegetation? Is it a peaceful place? I invite you to try to locate this special place of yours on this map. And I will be using this map to tell you about the quality of surface water around the world. And by surface water, I mean rivers, lakes, or wetlands. Let's start by looking at the areas in green. These areas have shown excellent surface water quality, which means that you could go ahead and drink the water without the need to treat it previously. As you can see, there's very little green on the map. And to be fair, there are some areas for which we do not have enough information. These are the areas in light gray. Here, we don't know exactly what's going on. But we do know what's going on in the areas in yellow. These areas have shown some levels of biological contamination which means that they can contain either bacteria or other microorganisms in the surface water. And the areas in orange have shown high levels of biological contamination. But biological contamination is not the only thing that could be harmful to humans and to the environment. Toxicity could also come from heavy metals or from human-made chemicals, such as pesticides or industrial chemicals. If you look at the areas that are striped, these show some levels of toxicity. And the dotted areas show high levels of toxicity. Finally, the areas in purple have unusable surface water, according to the study shown here, for other reasons that are neither biological contamination nor toxicity. Well, as you can see, in most places around the world, you need to treat the water before you're able to drink it. How did we get here? How did humanity manage the water resources so poorly that there is so little green left on the map. To try to explain this, I'm going to walk you through history, starting with one ancient civilization, the Roman Empire. Romans already realized the importance of having clean, fresh water. And when it wasn't available to them nearby, they would build tilted channels and aqueducts to take the water from faraway mountains all the way to city centers. Romans also realized the importance of disposing dirty wastewater. So they built sewers to take water from households and public places all the way into rivers. So far so good. Time passed and we got to the Middle Ages. At this point, the infrastructures built by the Romans were only used in very few places. In fact, many people thought that bathing and hygiene were unhealthy. So we could also call these times the sanitary dark ages. And as time passed and the populations increased around the world, 
the chances were higher that someone would be living downstream of a city that was dumping wastewater into the river. In case there were diseases, bacteria or viruses could travel through the water and reach the populations downstream, which wasn't good. With time, people realized that. And in the Industrial Revolution, the first drinking water treatment plants were built. As, first the first, as well as the first regulations were implemented to dispose wastewater. And we got really good at removing things such as bacteria, solids, oils, or metals. However, at the same time that we were building these water treatment plants, we were also introducing new chemicals to water, human-made chemicals, such as pharmaceuticals, personal care products, pesticides, or industrial chemicals. And the problem is that some of these human-made chemicals have a very stable molecular structure, which makes them very persistent. And the water treatment plants that we build are not able to remove them. We arrive where we're at now. Scientists are trying to find ways to remove these human-made chemicals from water so that they do not enter the water cycle. And today, I'm going to be talking to you about a particularly persistent pharmaceutical called dietrisoate. Maybe you or someone in your family has recently had a CT scan. In a CT scan, your body is scanned to look at your blood vessels, tissues, and organs. And in this process, the pharmaceutical called dietrisoate is often given to the patients to enhance the contrast of the images, making it possible to detect things such as tumors. Therefore, dietrisoate is very helpful for medical diagnosis. However, as the patients leave the CT scan, eventually, Dietrisoid leaves your body through urine and enters the wastewater streams. And when wastewater from hospitals containing dietrisoid arrives to a wastewater treatment plant, it goes through different treatment steps. Typically, one of the last treatment steps is disinfection, which in many countries around the world is done with chlorine. Unfortunately, scientists realize that dietrisoid and chlorine react and form something that's carcinogenic. So instead of removing the atresoid completely from water, we're producing something that's way worse. And let's say we don't want to use this chlorine. Well, in that case, the atresoid would travel through the wastewater treatment plant without being removed and could reach rivers, lakes, and eventually it could also reach a drinking water treatment plant downstream. Where at the latest there, we want the disinfection step because we do not want our drinking water to contain any bacteria or viruses. Again, in many countries around the world, this is done with chlorine, which just displaces the problem to later. Because chlorine can be quite problematic, some countries are thinking of banning it. And in that case, we have the problem that dietary soil travels through the full water cycle and can reach us back through drinking water. So how do we solve this issue? This is where my research comes in. I use electric discharges to clean the water. Think of lightning over a lake or ocean. Now picture this very tiny inside the reactor. This is how my reactor works. And I'm going to walk you through it. Here you can see a picture of my reactor, which contains a small volume of water, about 80 milliliters, because it is laboratory scale. But this concept could be scaled up to treat larger water volumes. In a schematic, it will be easier to explain you how my reactor works. I start off by bubbling gas from the bottom of the reactor. And this gas is quite important. And I will get back to this in a few minutes. The next thing that I do is that I apply electric discharges over the water surface. You see, when you apply electric discharges over water, you can do two things. One, you can start chemical reactions that will degrade the contaminants and clean the water. And two, you can heat up the water. And we want to minimize energy losses. We don't want to heat up the water. In order to achieve this, what I do is that I put high voltage pulses that are high enough to start the chemical reactions, but then I stop the voltage pulses really fast in less than 100 nanoseconds before the water gets heated up too much. And I repeat this again and again over time. So high voltage starting the chemical reactions and then stopping it very quickly before the water gets heated. I do this 3,000 times in one second, which means that if I was doing a water treatment over the duration of this presentation, I would be putting in about 3 million pulses. Now let's see a picture of the electric discharge in real life. This is how it looks like. You may see that it is purple. The color of the electric discharge depends on the type of gas that's inside the reactor. 
And let's have a closer look at the chemical reactions happening in the reactor. In an electric field, electrons get accelerated. Electrons are the little balls, whereas the big red balls are atoms. Let's see what happens as the electrons get accelerated by the electric field. Let's stop here for a minute. As you saw, as the electrons travel down, they collide with atoms. And when they do so, an electron is kicked out from the atom. An atom is neutral, so if you remove an electron, which is a negative charge, what remains behind is positive. And this is what we call an ion. Therefore, by accelerating these electrons and having them collide with atoms, we're producing an ionized gas that we also refer to as plasma. Let's look at it again. Well, in a reactor, there's not only three atoms. There's a lot of atoms, a lot of electrons. It would look a little bit more like this. And not only are there atoms, electrons, and ions in an electric discharge, you're also producing other reactive species, such as radicals, excited molecules, or you can produce UV light. In a nutshell, this is a highly reactive mixture. And if this wasn't complex enough, remember that we're bubbling gas from the bottom of the reactor. This gas could be, for example, air, which would travel through the water and reach the electric discharge, that we also call the plasma zone, and would react there. If we use another gas, for example, oxygen, the oxygen would also reach the plasma zone. And the chemical reactions happening when you have oxygen are different to the ones that would happen if you would have air. And this can be extremely useful. We will see this later in my results. Now, we have all these reactive species above the water surface. They eventually get to the water surface, diffuse into the water and react there, forming something that we call reactive oxygen nitrogen species, also RONs, as scientists refer to them. So for the duration of this talk, I'm going to treat you like scientists, and we're going to call them RONs from now on. The purpose of using these plasma discharges and producing RONs is ultimately to clean water, to treat water. So what we produce is a plasma-activated water. And let's have a closer look at what happens inside this plasma-activated water. You could have a contaminant, such as dietary soil, in the water. And as the RONs are traveling around, they eventually reach the contaminant. When they do so, they attack the chemical bonds, breaking the molecule into smaller and smaller pieces. I hope that now you have an idea of how we can use plasma to activate water and how this can break down persistent pharmaceuticals or chemicals such as dietary soil. Now let's have a look at the actual results in the lab. I start off by using a dye. For the ones interested, it's called methyl blue. And the purpose of using a dye is that you can see changes very easily. The initial structure of the dye has a very deep blue color. And as the molecule is broken down into smaller and smaller pieces, the dye loses its color, which makes it very easy to optimize parameters inside the reactor with these changes. I started off by optimizing the voltage. Remember that we're putting in high voltage pulses to start the chemical reactions. So if we put in five kilovolts, it takes 70 minutes to remove the dye. If we increase the voltage to 7 kilovolts, it takes about 15 minutes to remove the dye. And finally, if we increase the voltage all the way to its maximum, 11 kilovolts, it takes only about 20 minutes to remove the dye. So we saw that with increasing voltage, we're able to remove the dye faster. And if we want to remove it the fastest, we would choose 11 kilovolts, the highest voltage. Well, remember, we're not only putting high voltage pulses, we're also repeating this over time. And in this case, we're putting 1,000 pulses per second. We can also change this. Let's fix the voltage to 7 kilovolts. And then if we do 1,000 pulses per second, it takes 15 minutes to remove the dye. Increasing the pulse frequency to 3,000 pulses per second, it takes half the time, 25 minutes. Increasing further to 5,000 pulses per second takes 12 minutes. And finally, if we increase it to 9,000 pulses per second, it takes only 8 minutes to remove the dye. So again, we can see with increasing pulse frequency, the dye is removed faster. However, in this case, my optimal parameter was not the highest, not 9,000 pulses per second. It was 3,000 pulses per second. And the reason is that I was limited by my power supply, which is homemade. It was built in my lab, and I was testing its limits. So when I was testing it at 5,000, 9,000 pulses per second, it was overheating, and I didn't want to break it. Therefore, I had this limitation. I had to stop at 3,000 pulses per second to be able to use the power supply long term. 
Now that we've optimized the voltage and the pulse frequency, let's put in this tricky contaminant diatrisoid in the reactor and see what happens. After 40 minutes, about 40% of diatrisoid is removed, which is already pretty good since diatrisoid is very hard to break down. So this is already a start. But I thought maybe we can improve this further. And as we, we cannot improve the voltage and pulse frequency further, what we could do is we could change the type of gas, which I mentioned earlier is quite important. Here, I was using an air plasma, it's the same type of plasma that I was using for the previous experiments that I showed with the dye. Well, by replacing this air plasma by an oxygen plasma, I was able to remove the dye almost completely after 40 minutes, whereas with air, we, could, we have removed less than half. So this is really great news. Now we can remove dietary soil in a reasonable amount of time. And not only this, if we were using commercial power supplies, which are more powerful than the one that I have, we could remove it even faster. So now we've proven the concept that plasma can break down the molecule into smaller pieces. But now I'm interested in looking at these smaller pieces and seeing what happens to them, because I do not want any unintended consequences to happen as we saw earlier on with Karine. So what we did in my lab is that we took this solution of plasma-treated dietary soil with all the small molecules that we had produced as broken down pieces, and we did a standard toxicity test, a test which works with bacteria. And the way it works is that you give the solution containing dietary soil and the smaller pieces to bacteria. If they survive, it means that it's not toxic. And if the bacteria die, it means that it's toxic. And the good news is that the bacteria survived. And then we, we were able to prove that what we're producing is not toxic. Ultimately, my goal is to contribute to finding technologies that will be able to remove human-made chemicals so that they do not enter the water cycle. Not only dietary soil could be removed by plasma, but also hundreds of others, uh, hundred other human-made chemicals. And I hope that water research around the world will lead to having more and greener areas on the map so that soon, and for the generations to come, both humans and the environment can profit from clean water. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. If you have questions for Elena, don't forget to send them in via Twitter or email. Our second change maker, Bruno Castillo, is a second year PhD student in the Department of Mining and Materials Engineering, working with Professor Richard Cromick, and co-supervised by Professor Christian Moreau from Concordia University. Bruno is going to tell us about how new combinations of materials can be used as coatings for aerospace engine parts that can reduce friction and wear, increasing both energy and material efficiency. Bruno, please. When you talk about sustainability, most of the times the first thing that we think is either clean ways of producing energy, just like wind turbines or solar panels, or new ways of using this energy, just like with electric vehicles. If you are into engineering, one thing that you might think is new ways and more efficient ways of producing our products, just like with additive manufacturing. Well, another important part of sustainability is how well we're using the energy we produce and the products that we make. And let me tell you, we are not doing a good job. Today, I'm going to talk to you about two main losses in engineering, friction and wear. Both are present everywhere. Do you want an example? Put your hands together and start rubbing them against each other. You start feeling the heat, right? This heat is you transferring energy from your body into motion, into heat, by rubbing two different surfaces, your hands in this case. Now, if I asked you to do that for a few minutes, maybe the whole duration of the stock, you start noticing some blistering, some dead skin on your hand, that would be where? Well, it's kind of seem negligible, but if you go to industrial applications, then things start to be significant. What you see now is how much each country consumes of energy and how much they waste due to friction and wear. Well, it still doesn't look like much, but if we add them all together, you'd see that we are, cons we are wasting more than the entire United States consumes and we are almost reaching China. There are a lot of different ways that we can waste friction energy by friction and wear. Today, I'm going to talk about mainly transportation. If you think about transportation, what we have is road transportation with trucks, bus, cars. We have airplanes, we have trains, and we have ships. 
Well, if you were to organize them by the number of vehicles, then road transportation would become, it would be the highest one. But another way of looking into that is in terms of energy intensity, which is a measurement of how much energy you need to transport one ton of cargo per one kilometer. Then aerospace industry comes first. So it makes sense for us to try to minimize energy and friction losses in the aerospace industry. If you focus on an airplane, more than 10% of the energy goes to overcome friction. And more than 105 Canadian billion Canadian dollars are spent in maintenance. But 40% of all that is just in engine parts. But what makes the engine such a demanding part? Well, when you think about the engine of an airplane, most likely you think of this. That huge thing attached to the wings that makes that rumbling noise that troubles you throughout the whole trip. However, when a mechanical materials engineer is thinking about an uh, engine, he thinks about this, a cross-section of an engine. More importantly, the high temperatures and pressures that are inside there. I'm talking about more than 1800 degrees C and more than 30 atmospheres of pressure. This is really demanding conditions. So what we want is try to minimize and control friction and wear in this application. Well, the usual way to control friction and wear is either by lubrication, or coatings. You can think of lubrication just like when you're doing the exercise with your hands, if you put some oil or some hand soap or something like that, it will make it easier to move, right? This means that you're losing less energy to make the movement. This would be lubrication. Coatings, on the other hand, would be like putting some gloves. Then the contact will not be between your hands, but between the gloves itself, and you would worn out the gloves and not your hands. Well, unfortunately, in such high temperatures, lubrication is not that feasible. The high temperatures will burn any oil that you can try to put in, and it will lose its lubricating properties. So we have to go with coatings. But even that, there are few materials that can do that, that can work in such conditions. So what can we use? Well, we could use either metallic coatings or ceramic coatings. Another option, however, is to combine both of them, making a metal matrix composite or a ceramic matrix composite. This way, you can combine both materials, both properties of the materials, into one single coating. But what if we added even more materials? Let's say one more metal and one more ceramic. Then what you have is a, a multi-component coating. This way, each different metal and each different ceramic can have a different role to protect the part that we want. A material could be used for providing lubrication at higher temperatures, sort of lubrication. Meanwhile, another material can resist oxidation or resist corrosion or resist wear. And combining them, we can make a coating that is stable throughout a different range of temperatures. This concept was actually applied for a NASA research center in the form of two materials. PS304 and PS400. Both work really well for their application. What I want to do in my project is try to see if those will work well for the application that we have, and if so, how they are working so well, and try to propose new combinations that can work well for our application too. How we are going to produce this coating? Well, the technique that we use is called atmospheric plasma spray. It consists of a gun, and attach it to a robotic arm. This arm moves back and forth covering the entire surface of the sample. Let's take a closer look at the gun. What you see now is a cross-section of the gun. Gas flows from left to right, uh, either argon or helium or other inert gases. And as they flow and approach the tip of the gun, we apply a huge voltage there. This voltage can dissociate and ionize the gases and make plasma, just like Elena just told you. This ionized gas and this plasma can, is really hot and can melt all the particles that we put in. These melted particles are accelerated, accelerated towards the coating or the surface that we want to protect, building up the coating. Well, we actually did that. By using this technique, we produce a coating using data from literature for the parameters of spray or the position. This is what we got. 
So what you see in the top part is the coating in the bottom, the coated sample. Well, let's remove this box for a moment so we can see the coating. In this type of image, it's an electron microscopy image, different contrasts have different meanings. What I mean is that different materials have different more atomic weight, and then it shows different in the image. A white contrast means a heavier element, and a darker contrast means a, a lighter element. Based on that, we can see that we have the metal one, which is the bright one, the metal two, which is the gray one, and we have those small particles that are the ceramic one. However, we noticed that we didn't find the ceramic two that was supposed to be there. Furthermore, the coating had really bad properties like mechanical strength, adhesion, and cohesion between the particles. The last problem that we have is that the coating is really thin, indicating a really bad deposition efficiency. So what we tried to do, and based on the lack of the second ceramic, because though that one is the one that has the highest melting point, we thought that maybe what happened is that the stream was not hot enough to melt all the particles. In order to test that theory, what we did is a set of experiments, and we increased the flow rate of helium on the spray. Well, the helium has an effect of helping the heat transfer between the particle and the stream and makes the particle heat more. Furthermore, it also increases the temperature of the stream. As we start increasing the amount of helium, we start noticing more and more coating being deposited up to the moment that we reached the limit that we had in the equipment and we also didn't want to burn any more of the samples. So if you hit too much, the sample might be burned. Then we did another cross-section, just like the one that you saw, another electron microscopy image to see what we got. And this is what we got. On your left is the coating that we produced at first, and on the right, the coating after the optimization parameters. Now, we can see the metal one that we already know, the white one, the gray one, the metal two, the ceramic one is still there, and the ceramic two now is present. The coating also is really more thicker than what we had before, indicating that now we have good deposition parameters for producing our coatings. Okay, but now we have a suitable coating, a good coating. How do we test it? Well, ideally what we would do is put it on the turbine or in the engine, put it to run and then see how it goes. However, this is really not possible under the conditions that we have. So what we need to do is try to replicate those conditions in a small scale experiment. We do that by using a tribometer, just like the one you see in the image. What you see here in the bottom part is our coated sample and the counter, the counter face on top. So if we were to draw schematics for that, this is what you'd see. The coated sample, the coating that you cannot see right now in the image because it's too thin, and the counter body or counter face. Well, now if you put that into motion, what you would see is that different things can happen at the surface. Material can get mixed and oxidized and form what we call a tribofilm. Material can also get detached from the surface and attached to the counter body or counter face, forming what we call a transfer film. And material can leave the wear zone, calling what we call a wear debris. Well, why am I going through this? Because it is in this part that we will find out why the material behaves so well and what is being formed on the surface. Based on the information that we collect at this contact zone, we can propose different materials and new conditions to produce our coating and get the best result possible. We have some preliminary results that I'm going to share with you now. Well, first, we test for the friction coefficient, which is a measurement of how much energy you're losing. In this case, the lowest amount of friction coefficient, better it is for energy consumption, means that you're losing less energy. The baseline that you see is a material well known for us that is already being applied. When we tested the PS304, what we see is higher friction, especially at the end of the number of cycles that we ran. However, the PS400 showed really good results. 
and really promising results for our application. Now we need to check where, right? We want friction and where. When we did when we did the wear test and we observed the cross section, what we see is that the PS400 show less wear than the other materials, almost five fold the baseline that we had, which is really promising. What I want to do now is understand why this material is behaving so well and try with different loads, different speeds, and different temperatures to replicate the conditions faced by the engine before we can put it there to work. Today, I talked to you mainly about aerospace applications and materials to withstand high temperature. But this is not only limited for our aerospace industry. We can circle back and apply those anytime we have a high temperature, high pressure application. Furthermore, we can use it in another and other industries just like manufacturing. In one last note, there are some studies that show that if you correctly address the issues of friction and wear, we can save up to 18% of energy that we're losing in the short term only. That can reach up to 40% in the long term, and we can also save a lot of emissions in carbon dioxide and a lot of Canadian dollars. However, our change must start now. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. If you have questions for Bruno, please don't forget to send them in via Twitter or email. Our third change maker tonight is Rana Yakani, a third year PhD student in the Hydro Met Group, working under the supervision of Professor George Demopoulos. Rana is also collaborating with Professor Gruder from the Physics Department at McGill and Professor Leonelli from the Physics Department at University of Montreal. Rana is going to explain to us how novel perovskite solar cells can reduce the environmental impact of solar power generation and improve the economics of this important source of renewable energy. Rana, please. As you already know, this is a solar panel. You also know that solar panels offer a great advantage over fossil fuels. They provide us with a less carbon intensive path towards electricity. Despite such an advantage, the uptake in solar panels has not met the expectations. That is because the current solar technology, which is made of silicon, has proved to be financially challenging for the past 40 years and has been relying majorly on government subsidy for consumer uptake. To understand this problem better, I want to show you a quick analysis. The process to make silicon solar panels starts with piling up sand and then melting it using really high temperatures. This is the most energy exhaustive step of the process. Then from the molten sand, we create single individual silicon cells. And as for the final step of the process, we bring all of these individual cells together and assemble them into a module. Up until this point in the process, we have generated about 55 grams of carbon dioxide, which means to balance that out, we'd have to take that module and run it nonstop for five years. This is what we call the payback period. And as far as the payback period goes, this is considered to be a very good number. Unfortunately, however, this is not the end of this analysis. And there is one more aspect to consider. A solar cell manufacturer has different sources of cost to cover, from materials to equipment and maintenance. Which means that if I were to agglomerate the carbon dioxide analysis and the cost analysis, I'd be looking into realistic payback periods as long as 10 years. I want to bring this to your attention that the expected lifetime of silicon solar panels is about 20 years, which means by the time that you're done paying off the carbon debt and offsetting the profit margin, half the lifetime of your solar panel has already passed. So now you understand that despite being a very promising technology, silicon solar panels are associated with high amounts of emitted carbon dioxide and manufacturing costs. But here's the thing. What if we could keep utilizing solar technology as a path to produce electricity, but rather benefit from a lower carbon footprint and manufacturing costs at the same time? Well, I'm here today to tell you that that is in fact possible through utilizing proskite solar cells. However, while proskite solar cells and silicon solar cells start off with the same number of efficiency for converting sunlight into electricity, after a while, and because of some processes that happen during the operation of proskite solar cells, their efficiency values start to decrease until the cell goes fully offline in about 24 months. 
Before I tell you why the things happen, let me bring some material science into this. Palestine solar cells are made from a few different layers, with each layer serving a very distinct purpose. At the heart of the solar cell, we have the cross cut layer, which is arguably the most important one because it can absorb the sunlight and break it down into a currency that the system is able to spend later to generate electricity. This currency is a positive and negative charge. So far, we understand that these solar cells get their name from their absorber layer. And now the question is, where does the absorber layer get its name from? Prostite is the name of the crystal structure, or in other words, how the elements line up with respect to each other on the atomic level. When prostate technology first started, the composition had only methyl ammonium, lead, and iodide. And now after 10 years of constant development to render efficiencies competitive with silicon, the composition is way more complicated than that. This is something that I'll get back to later when I explain my research. But for now, let me show you how these solar cells actually function. When this cell is sitting in a dark room, nothing is really happening. We still have the positive and negative charges that I told you about, but they're sitting still because they have no energy. But we can change that by placing that solar cell under the sunlight. Because now, like I told you before, the proskite layer is going to absorb the sunlight and the positive and negative charges that were sitting still suddenly gain enough kinetic energy to move as far away from each other as possible. This is where the capability of the proskite layer ends. Now we need two new layers that are capable of transporting these charges. For that reason, we have the negative transport layer to transport the negative charges and the positive transfer layer to transfer the positive charges. We also have the metal contact to extract the positive charge and the base layer to extract the negative charge out of the solar cell. So now that you know how the solar cells actually function, let's go back to the separated positive and negative charge and see what actually happens to them. In an ideal case, these charges are going to get transported through all of these layers really fast, go in the outer circuit, recombine, and give us electricity. However, in reality, things are a little bit different. We still end up separating the positive and negative charge and sending them off to the respective transport layers. However, we will not be able to transport them through all of these layers in the timescales that we are interested in. To understand why, let me bring up the proskite crystal structure again and remind you that we have a few different elements involved here, which means when the sunlight comes in, positive and negative charges are not going to be the only moving species. We'll also have the positive and negative elements that will get a kick from the sun and start moving around until they reside right behind the lineup of charges that are waiting so impatiently to get out of the system. As a result of this accumulation, these elements are going to apply some attraction forces on the charges and in essence, trap them in their place. This explains why the charges are unable to get out of the system in fast timescales. This situation is a little bit less severe for positive charges because after a few rounds of trying, they finally manage to get themselves in the positive transport layer and eventually the outer circuit. However, for negative charges, the struggle is real. They're going to have to try for much longer before they can finally get themselves into the respective transfer layer, the base layer, and eventually the outer circuit. This delay that is associated with the transport of negative charge is essentially the root cause of the problem. Because the charges that are trapped at the interface of the proskite layer and the negative transport layer against their will are going to retaliate by causing some electrochemical reactions and therefore degrading the entire proskite solar cell structure in about 24 months. What I'm focused on is making a negative transport layer that acts as a highway for the charges and enables them to get out of the system as fast as possible. Let me show you what I do in the lab to achieve that goal. I start off with a piece of conductive glass as my base layer, and then using some high temperature and high pressure processes, I make these rod-like structures on a nanometer scale, or as we call them, nanorods. Then I infiltrate these very small structures with the proskite layer, and to finish things up, I deposit the positive transport layer. Now, I want to dive a little bit deeper in my research here. In a more detailed view, I'm interested in how playing around with the length of these nanorods can actually affect the performance of the resulting solar cell. And to understand that, I measure some parameters. And naturally, the first thing I look at is the stability. What I discovered was that the stability of proskite solar cells based on longer nanorods tend to be higher, which is encouraging. 
but I also measure the efficiency and realize that it does not necessarily follow the same trend as stability. But my research can help us with understanding that. So the first thing that I want to show you is the interface between the negative transport layer and the base layer. Longer nanorods tend to cover the base layer better, which means that they do a better job at preventing the prospect layer from directly touching the base layer. Now that is important because the charges that tried so hard to untrap themselves from the proskite layer will have to go through the negative transport layer first before entering the base layer or we are going to lose them. And if we lose them, they will not be able to contribute to making electricity. There is one more aspect to this. When light enters each one of these structures, it is going to have a limited number of interactions before it finally manages to escape. The number of interactions that light has with solar cells based on longer nanorods tend to be higher. This is because there are more surfaces to bounce off of. This essentially means that we are trapping the light and then recycling it over and over again and as a result creating more charges. But this by itself creates a big question. Why does the solar cell that gives us the best coverage and the best light trapping properties still does not yield the best efficiency? To understand that, let's take a step back. And remember the most important parameter associated with proskite solar cells. They tend to trap the charge at the interface and make it difficult for them to get out, which is why we measure a very important parameter called resistance, which tells us how resistant a certain negative transport layer is towards the transport of negative charges. What we discovered was that while a negative transport layer might be excellent at trapping the light and covering the base layer, it might not necessarily be the best choice for providing the charges with the fastest route out of the system. So far, I've been telling you about my efforts with regards to optimizing the negative transport layer. Now let me show you what I've been doing about the proskite layer. When it comes to this layer, I'm interested in how I can fix the composition, but vary the deposition method, or fix the deposition method, but vary the composition to possibly tailor and fine tune the properties of the resulting proskite solar cell. And what we discovered was that the composition that you're looking at right now has superior properties in terms of both efficiency and stability over every other composition that we have tried so far. Today, I've been telling you how through utilizing proskite technology, we have this opportunity to reduce the carbon footprint and manufacturing costs of solar cells. Fortunately for us, there is one more aspect to this good story. Proskite solar cells are projected to overtake silicon and reach efficiencies of 30% and beyond in the near future. With increased efficiency, decreased manufacturing costs, and decreased carbon footprint, as a consumer, you'll be looking into payback periods as low as five years for proskites, as opposed to 10 years for silicon. Which means anybody who wants to purchase an efficient solar panel will not be discouraged by looking at the price tag anymore. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rana. I would now like to open the floor for any questions that you may have for Elena, Bruno, or Rana. Just a reminder that you can still submit your questions for the change makers. We have someone monitoring both our email and Twitter. And we're gonna to try to get to all of the questions that come in for our three speakers. Great, thank you. So the first question that we have tonight, thank you to everyone who's listening and, uh, and for sharing your questions. Uh, please send them in as, uh, as we keep going. We'll, we'll continue to try to get to all of them that we can. Um, so the first question um, comes to Elena, uh, which is a question about the amount of electrical power that the process might consume, for example, say for a medium-sized hospital. Okay, well, I haven't done the calculation for a medium-sized hospital. But I do know that plasma technologies take usually between one and 10 kilowatt, kilowatt hour per cubic meter per order of magnitude of reducing contaminants. So then you can maybe do the math depending on how much volume you have. Great, thank you. Okay, the second question I think I'll ask to, uh, is to Bruno, um, which is uh, from Twitter asking what has been one of the biggest challenges that you've faced in your project? It's by Alejandra Islas. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, 
the fact that we are dealing with different materials and they all can get mixed together and during wear and get oxidized. And so it's really difficult to identify them and try to figure out what is reducing friction and higher temperature, what is causing the reduction of wear and friction and try to attribute them to different materials and try to find one single material responsible for that. So I think it's pretty challenging and we need to use a lot of uh, analytical techniques and like a lot of SEM and Raman to try to identify those phases and correlate them. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe the third, the third question I'll ask to Rana, um, what do you see as, as being the, the steps that are needed to go from where you're at right now in the, in the lab towards a commercial product that could take this uh, to market and to be sold in industry? Thank you. That's actually a very good question. Um, there has been two major obstacles so far uh, in front of cross guides uh, to be upscale. One of them is the toxicity and the other one is the stability. Um, toxicity has been more or less dealt with, but I imagine stability is actually the issue that needs to be uh, really dealt with. And this is something that I'm working on in the lab right now, looking at interfaces, how we can stabilize these reactions, preventing lead from, you know, going into the nature and actually like polluting waters and so on. So I believe the answer would be stability and probably dentist. And stability, you mean like the lifetime of the... Uh... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because of this, the lifetimes are actually very short. Great, thank you. Um, another question for Elena. Um, one of the questions is that uh, there's also, so that it comes from uh, Daniel Morales says, I've seen previous work of using plasma to also kill bacteria in water. What do you think about an integrated setting or setup that could not only destroy harmful chemicals, but also viruses and bacteria? I guess, especially important in today's world. Well, actually you do everything already at the same time. In another side project, I'm using my plasma treated water for a cancer treatment and well for other medical issues and the plasma is so reactive that in one only with, the, with the, all the reactive species at the same time you can kill bacteria viruses destroy contaminants so that's already there in my plasma treated water that's great that's very exciting thank you i have another question um coming in for bruno uh, it's a question via twitter uh, it says uh, I'd like to know what are the next steps of your research and what excites you the most about it? Well, uh, right now I'm, I'm in the earlier stages of my research. So uh, it's the second year and we're starting the preliminary test. Uh, the next steps are trying to increase the temperature and analyze the coating in such conditions. Also try to put the coatings under uh, different atmospheres, just like uh, sulfur and things like that to see if the coating will be, will be stable and if it will continue to perform well. And the second question, I'm sorry, uh, could you come again? So, so what are the next steps of your research and then what excites you most about it? Oh, I think that to try to correlate the things that I see, so there are the tests are quite separate. So we do the wear test in one place and then we need to correlate what we observe by microscopy and other techniques. And when those things match and you see that you're moving forward and you're expanding your knowledge, it's really exciting. That's really what science is all about, right? Is that exactly. connection of <laughs> things towards a causality. And that's, that's great. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I think the next question I have um, is for Rana, which is uh, what companies around the world are developing perovskite technology? Um, there are a few companies. Uh, the biggest one would be Oxford PV. Um, they're the offshoot of Oxford University, and they're currently doing production and manufacturing in Germany. Uh, there's Fluxem in uh, Switzerland, and uh, there is one company in Poland, which I don't quite remember the name of. Uh, but there are the three major companies right now that are doing cross guides. And the focus is on making cross guides that either alone or in tandem with other solar cells to increase the efficiency, increase the stability, um, or basically working on more stable compounds of cross guides alone. That's great. And I read an article this morning uh, or this afternoon, actually, that was talking about uh, perovskites kind of upending the solar industry with 
promises of, of gains in efficiency, but I think specifically in cost and in impact, as you talked about today. So it's definitely becoming a, a hot topic. That's great. Another question um, is for Elena. The, the question is, if, in, in, if we're implementing this plasma treatment method, there would already be some sort of upstream treatment processes that, um, that you know, you would be separating out solid, solids and other things. What would happen to those byproducts if you apply, say, a disinfectant like chlorine into, uh, into those other products? I'm, I understand the question that after the plasma treated water, you want to apply chlorine, not before, right? It would be... But yeah, I think thing. actually the question is, uh, is what might happen to the treatment byproducts when you add, uh, so that some of the things were already pre-treated in, in earlier steps. Okay, so, well, if we take water that's already been treated and you remove solids and then you go ahead and treat it with plasma, you are treating both the pharmaceutical parent compound and all the smaller broken down molecules. And I have not tried to test it to combine those with chlorine, but the idea is to destroy them so much that they are not toxic anymore. So I, have, I don't have the answer for chlorine. I haven't tested them myself. Great, thank you. No, I think that that answers the question. Another question uh, for Bruno, which is, uh, does the mixing of the different materials and the coatings have any impact on their end of life or the recyclability? It's a good question. I think these coatings, they are really, really thin. So it's really hard to think of them in terms of recyclability because like they either worn out or you just like, you don't have the coat anymore. We're talking about something in the order of 100 microns, like as thin as your hair. So it's really tough to think about in terms of recyclability. What we can do, however, is try to improve the spray process and lose less material there. But in terms of after part and after use, it's, it, I don't think there is any possibility as far as I know. <laughs> Great, no, I, but I think that answers the question. Thank you. Okay, just looking for another question here. So there's a question for uh, Elena about the plasma method with oxygen. Um, and it's what's the difference between using the oxygen plasma or directly using ozone? Um, because there are ozone generators, uh, as it says, uh, ozone generators might be safer, safer, especially when scaling up. And there are already ozone treatment uh, units in some water treatment plants. What will be the merits of plasma treatment to replace ozone treatment? That's, that's a great question. Actually, when you're producing plasma discharges in oxygen, you do produce ozone. But that's not the only species you produce. You also produce hydroxyl radicals, so OH radicals, hydrogen peroxide, single oxygen radicals, single hydrogen radicals. So this, this makes it much more reactive. And in fact, ozone has failed to remove diatrisoid. And this reactive mixture with these all added reactants is, is able to remove diatrisoid. So you go one step further, basically. That's great. Thank you, that's excellent. Okay, well, if there's other questions from uh, the audience, please do uh, share them um, with us. I think I'll ask a little bit of a selfish question here to uh, to the three speakers, which was, what was the most unexpected thing that you learned during the said talks um, process, and, uh, and and what do you take away from it? So maybe we'll let Rana go first, and we'll go in reverse order. <laughs> um, I think I was surprised how much uh, my content and posture, performance, presentation could actually improve. Um, I think the least uh, least of all what I always paid attention to was my presentation. I always focused about getting the content, getting the data. And I think set talks was actually a great opportunity to show us that um, the presentation matters, matters a lot. And so for me, that was the takeaway. That's great. Bruno. Yeah, uh, for me, I'll go with Run and this one. It was really like so far I've been focused on content and not much on how you present. And I think that Set Talks gave me the experience and the, the knowledge on how to be more comfortable with myself during presentations 
and how to deal with these situations that we feel a bit awkward presenting a button in front of a lot of people and get more comfortable with it. It was a really good experience. That's great. I, one thing that I can I can say is that you know you never it never becomes easy. I think it just that you become used to it, and, uh, and that's, that's a part of all of these things. Elena, I'll, I'll, I'll let you have a chance to answer the question as well. Uh, I enjoyed a lot to have the opportunity to practice giving talks for different audiences, and that has helped me a lot actually outside my research when I meet other people talk about my research in a way that's more accessible. And I think we worked a lot through that, how to make your talk more accessible. I think that's my greatest learning. Well, that's great. Thank you for that. Okay. Well, if, uh, if we don't have other questions coming in, I think I'm gonna uh, close with some final thank yous. Uh, if I can just pull it up here. So first of all, I'd like to thank everyone who shared their questions and I'm sorry if we missed some of them uh, during this, uh, this process. Um, but first of all, I'd like to thank our three said talks change makers for their presentations. Um, and I, I hope that everyone who joined us tonight has learned something new. Um, and we all wish the three of you the best as you complete your projects and your degrees and move on. Um, and I'd also like to, uh, to thank on behalf of the presenters, um, the alumni change makers, the faculty members, the industrial partners, um, who all gave their time to give feedback to the students um, as they develop their talks over the past the past months. Um, and also on behalf of the change makers, I'd like to thank their supervisors for supporting them as they undertook what is a pretty significant commitment of time and might be seen as taking them away from the research, but I think in the end, uh, the efforts uh, definitely pay off. Um, I'd like to thank the Tizen team for their efforts in helping to organize and coordinate this event. Really, that was twice because we were one week away from the live event in March when COVID shut everything down. Um, and then we had to re reboot and, and prepare for this online event. And I think if this year's taught us anything, it's that we need to be adaptable uh, and resilient. And I really appreciate the adaptability and resilience of everyone involved in said talks uh, and especially the three change makers um, talking here today. I'd also like to thank uh, the skill set staff at Teaching and Learning Services here at McGill. They offered a lot of customized support uh, for learning, uh, for skills training, worked with all of our students, uh, both those who took part in the fall and the three change makers, um, and I think have made a big impact um, in developing professional and communication skills. Um, and I have to give a really special acknowledgement to uh, the efforts of Andrew Churchill. Um, he worked with the students throughout the program and he's become an invaluable asset to, uh, to said talks and to this program. The work of Tizen wouldn't be possible without the strong support from our donors, some of whom uh, are in the audience tonight. And this is the time when I normally invite all of you to join us for a cocktail and a discussion in the next room. And I, I certainly miss the opportunity to meet and engage with all of our sustainability community. Um, and I really, that's what said talks is about is bringing together a community of people who are engaged and interested in solving these problems. Um, but I hope also that the online nature of the event has enabled more people to take part and hear about the work that our students are doing to advance this research, to learn something new and to, and to get engaged. And, uh, to close, I'd just like to say that our change makers have only presented just a small snapshot of the great work and sustainability that's being done at McGill. I hope that their presentations inspire other graduate students from various disciplines across the faculty to take part in this program in the future. And uh, registration for the next year of the Said Talks program is still open. And of course, because of the current situation, the fall communication workshop is going to focus more on effective communication in a virtual format, uh, which is, I think, uh, a skill that we can all recognize is going to be uh, in demand in the coming months and maybe years. Um, and so please visit the website at the link um, to, uh, to learn more and to sign up. On behalf of Tized, I want to thank each and every one of you um, for being part of our 2020 Set Talks event. Please stay safe, please stay healthy, and good night and bonsoir à tous. Thank you. <laughs>